I don't teach martial arts. I create martial artists. Hello, and welcome to Episode 5 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, your host for the show and the president of Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. On today's show, we have Master Adam Grogan, a lifelong Taekwondo student, instructor, promoter, and competitor from Northern New York. I met Master Grogan last year when we were introduced by Master Hughes and Alexander. You may remember him from Episode 1. Master Grogan is a great guy and is doing more to spread the martial arts than most people I know. You'll see what I mean when we get into the episode. I was really struck by how dedicated he truly is. For some people, the martial arts is a calling, and Master Grogan is one of those people. Listen. Master Grogan, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hi, how are you today? I'm doing great, thanks. I, I really appreciate you being here. Well, I'm really honored to be here, so thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really excited about this. Well, cool. Let's get into it. This should be fun. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about your history with the martial arts? Um, let's see. So I've been doing martial arts for about 28 years now. Um, my main background is of Korean style, Taekwondo, a um, little bit of all the different types of Taekwondo, ITF, WTF, and dabbled in that. But I also am um, pretty experienced with a lot of different things such as uh, Wushu, Wing Chun. I really like extreme martial arts and the acrobatics, a little Kun Tao. So I, I'm pretty diversified, but I'd say my meat and potatoes is definitely the, the Taekwondo world. Okay. Wow, that's pretty broad. Um, now, you... You are not just a, a practitioner of the martial arts. You're also a school owner and tournament promoter. Yep. I, uh, I own a school called Pilsung Martial Arts. It's uh, Korean words, and it's in Albany, New York. We've been here for now just about celebrating our 10th anniversary, so I'm uh, something I'm very proud of with that. We're a small school. You know, We focus a little bit more on the quality of our students, and I do consider us a school, not a business, and we have a lot of fun here. Well, cool. Congratulations on that anniversary. That's a big deal. Thank you. Thank you very much. How did you get started in the martial arts? Um, actually, my parents tell me, because I was very young at the time, that it was the movie The Original Karate Kid in the 80s that I saw when I was probably six years old. And uh, they brought me to start up some lessons after that because I wanted to. And now it's been going on, like I said, 28 years, and I've never stopped. And I just never took any breaks and just kept going the whole time. Well, you are certainly not the first person on this show to reference the Karate Kid. Uh -huh. uh, in fact, the episode that we recorded earlier today uh, made mention of the Karate Kid, and I think we had one last week that talked about the Karate Kid. Nice. Certainly, a, Yeah, certainly an influential movie for Absolutely most martial artists in our, our generation. Absolutely. When, when we talk to, to people who have been involved in the martial arts for a long time, and I, I think we could safely say you're a lifelong martial artist. Yes, sir. I mean, not a whole lot of a lot of years between your age and, and that start point. Yes, sir. Um, what, what would you say the martial arts has done for you? The martial arts, I don't want to say that it changed me because there was never a chance to be changed. I started at such a young age that there was, there was nothing about me to change, but I would say it formed me. Who I am today, I attribute 100% to my experience in the martial arts. Um, it really... I know a lot of people say it's a way of life, but I don't think some people when they say that or people when they hear it truly understand when people say martial arts is a way of life, how much that means. I mean, it's not just an activity. It's not something I do. It's not a sport. It's who I am. And if I've had conversations with people or, or family or my wife and, you know, would I ever stop? I don't know who I'd be if I wasn't a martial artist because that's so much a whole of who I am. So when we talk about what it's done for me, it's made me the person I am today. It's given me the fulfillment I have in my life and the things that make me happy and the ability to give back, which I appreciate. But also, you know, I have other careers that I'm involved with too besides martial arts, and my success in those I attribute to the personality traits and characteristics that I've gotten out of being a martial artist, a confident leader, somebody with focus and discipline, which are all the things I've learned from the martial arts has helped shape me throughout my whole life. So, I mean – all the things that people talk about that martial arts is supposed to do or could do, I feel like I'm a living, breathing proof of that. You know, not to sound like a commercial, but it is possible, and, and I'm, I'm, I feel like that's the things I've gained from it. I completely agree. I've some of the, the phrases you used are things I've found myself saying to others, and it just kind of in, um, gave me the thought, you can take the man out of the martial arts, but you can't take the martial arts out of the man. It's, Even if you did stop training, you would still be you. Exactly. It, it's, you can't stop. Like I don't know how not to be me, and me as a martial artist. Uh, one of the, it's, a, 
it's our little I have a slogan I created for my school. I'm not big on marketing, but um, the little slogan I came up with that I wanted to kind of try to come up with a way of saying what I'm saying is that I don't I don't teach martial arts. I create martial artists because that's kind of like the way I see my my representation of martial arts is I'm not teaching somebody a sport or an activity or how to defend themselves. I'm creating a different person. I'm changing them or developing them or forming them into a different type of individual. That's fabulous. Um, I, I, I'm i actually jotting that down. Nice. I'm going to show that in the throw notes. Nice, yeah. I, I, that, that, one day that just hit me and I was like, jackpot. I felt really good about that. Yeah, for sure. Um, cool. Nice. So why don't you think about a low point in your life that your martial arts experience helped you through? Oh, well, that's an easy one for me. See, I've always been a martial artist. It's always been my passion, who I am, everything I did. Growing up, I didn't do any other sports. I did just martial arts. I worked at my martial arts school. It was my first job. I lived there, basically. It's always been my life. But in my you know, late teens, early 20s, I had a career path that did not include owning a school. I always wanted to be a martial artist, but I wanted to find a pretty financially successful career for myself. I'm very goal-oriented, and I, at the time, felt that martial arts schools, I didn't want to be involved with that because of the financial gain possibilities, but sometimes, unfortunately, mean having to compromise a little bit you know, with quality. I know that's not the case for everybody, but unfortunately, I think sometimes that is the case. So I had a very distinct career path of, uh, that I was going into um, grad school with, and I, I was going to always be a martial artist, but I never planned on opening a school. Unfortunately, in my early 20s, I went through a lot of personal uh, changes and some things that happened unexpectedly in my personal life that caused me to really need to just stop, and I, it put me at a crossroads, and I didn't know where to go and what I was going to do. My, my, my plans had changed um, due to unforeseen circumstances. And I was, can, can, you, yes. can you give us a little bit more detail? I don't, I don't want to pry too much, but you know, that's a time of life where a lot of us went through – yeah. Some pretty unexpected I, stuff, I some had, big stuff. Unfortunately, um, yeah, I was I was in school, in grad school, to, to actually go into a medical career is where I was aiming. And at the time, some really unexpected things happened with family and with the relationship I was in. And it kind of just stopped me right there. And and I uh, I was at a loss for a short period of time, and I basically just stopped school, and I, I didn't know where I was going to go with my life. And one day, I just decided that financial gain or success or not, I need to focus on what makes me happy and what makes me who I am. And that's when I said to myself, I want to open up my own school. And I just focused all my energy on that. And within three months, I had a building, a lease, a school, and everything just kind of happened. And my martial arts school and the goal of having a school and and my martial arts is really what got me through that hard time. And now 10 years later, I couldn't be any happier at that decision I made as to where I found myself and where life brought me following my passion of martial arts as my focus, not worrying about anything else. That's, you know, it, it, what, what's striking me about your, your thoughts there, there are, are a lot of business coaches and life coaches out there who would say just what you've done, follow your passion, you know, all that. And, here, here's a, a concrete example of you going off on a path that you thought was going to lead you to happiness, one that martial arts was going to play maybe a, a side role, a secondary role. And when that path didn't work out, you jumped back to the thing that you knew the best, martial arts, and you made that your passion. You made that your career. Yes. And if we skip forward 10 years – um, I don't know where you were going in medicine. Maybe you would be making more money, but I'm going to guess you would probably be working harder and you probably would be a little bit less satisfied at the end of the day. I don't know. What do you, what do I, you think? Uh, yeah, I would absolutely have been in a much more financially stable position than I, than I am now. Um, the fact that I run my school the way I run my school is not advised by most business coaches and things like that. I'm very much about my students, about my quality, and not about smart business decisions and marketing. But at the end of the day, I'm happy because not to be immodest in any way, but I've developed over 10 years a reputation in my area. My area is very saturated in martial arts schools. And there's a lot of great guys out there with great students and also guys that are very successful business owners in my, in my area. 
But at the end of the day, I have a reputation among all these schools that is something I'm very proud of, more proud than any big paycheck could bring me. Um, and even though the, the careers I found for myself during the day are not as financially satisfying as the career I was going to go for, the fact that I have my school, my reputation, and, and my happiness with my students, it, it definitely trumps all other things. Well, you know, different people <clears throat> excuse me, different people define success differently, yes. and it sounds like you've really found it. Yes, sir. I definitely would agree with that. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Great, great well, answer. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. So next question goes into who's been influential in your life. So I'd like to rule out your instructor or instructors, those that, that – you know, were were charged with leading you up through in the martial arts. Was there someone else that you can think of that was really influential in your martial arts path? Um, so I guess what I'd say, if I rule, I had a, I had, a, I had a primary master that I would attribute most of my my early education to, and then I had a couple others that influenced me at younger ages, but still they would still fall in the category of instructor. So if we're staying away from that, I would say that the next big milestone actually happened more recently in my adult martial art life, where I had grown up in this particular Taekwondo world that unfortunately, because of the way a lot of that is, was very isolated. There wasn't a lot of outside influence. So while that was good to get a pure taste of a particular style, I feel there's a lot of gain that can happen from being exposed to other other thoughts, other systems, other things. Um, and of more recently, in the past 10 years, I've actually been involved with the uh, United States Breaking Association, World Breaking Association. It started out because I hosted some martial art events that I had sanctioned by that organization, just looking to expand the horizons of the tournament. But in the process, I became very close, um, like a mentor-student relationship with the founders of that organization. Um, one gentleman's name is Grandmaster Ralph Bergamo. The other is Master Drew Serrano. They're the founders of the World Breaking Association. They're very famous breakers. Um, a side note, breaking is something I've always been very passionate about. We did a lot of breaking in Taekwondo. Nothing like is being done these days, but I've always been passionate about breaking. I'm a, uh, I'm a smaller stature man, uh, and especially martial artist. So I enjoyed breaking because of the fact that I was able to develop my key energy, and I was able to do feats that people didn't expect a smaller statured martial artist to do. I, I was able to break piles of wood or different things that you'd expect from a big guy to come out. And here I'm a little guy and I come out. So I used to always enjoy finding that inner energy. So I naturally had a connection with this breaking association. And the, over the past 10 years, besides growing within the organization where I'm now the um, Northeast Regional Director for the organization, I run all the events, I also formed this mentor-student relationship with both the masters that run the organization and have had more personal gain, I think, in the past 10 years for me, myself, as a martial artist, learning from them, as much so as I did in my early years, just learning through the ranks of, of my early career. So I would really say that they have been huge influences on me, and especially taking me to a world-class level that, that I would be identified at now for my breaking skills. Cool. Cool. Do you have a favorite break, favorite breaking technique? Um, I guess our favorites sometimes tend to be what we're good at, and my two specialties would be um, in the breaking in the breaking events. There tend to be um, there's concrete divisions, and then there's wood divisions. There's quantitative divisions, which are like called power divisions, where it's all about how much you break. So two, three, four, five, whatever the guys are up there, they all break the same technique. So it'd be all hand or all elbow. And they put up a stack, and whoever breaks the most, it would be a quantitative division. Then you also have like a judge division with a score that's a creative. So in the power divisions, I'm pretty good, I would say, immodestly, at uh, wood hand and at concrete elbow are my two favorite events that I compete in a lot. Okay, cool. And do you, what's, what's the, your best, your personal best with each of those? Um, let's see. So for concrete elbow at the ISKA uh, World Breaking Championships at the U.S. Open in Orlando, Florida last year, I placed fourth in the world for the lightweight, and I broke 11. And then wow. my personal best for wood hand, I think is 12, 12 or 13. I think I did a competition a couple of years ago um, around, around that. So I'm pretty proud of those numbers. As you should Thank be. Those you, are very impressive numbers. So I know, and and I'm sure listeners have picked up on it, that competition is something that's big for you. It's important to you. Uh, of course, we met at a martial arts competition, mm -hmm. and I just saw you 
a few days ago at a martial arts competition. Yes, sir. So have it going out to all these competitions, is there one that sticks out? Yes, and actually, well, I mean, I'm, I'll preface that a little bit with, with what you just said about competition. I think it's important. I, I love talking about competition in general just because I think it's a great thing. I know a lot of people are sometimes weary of it, and some schools are weary of competition because sometimes – you know, if your student doesn't do good, they might quit, and as a business move, it's not good. But growing up for me, I – like I said, martial arts was my life. It was my world, and all my friends were in my martial arts school. So for me, the best part was the weekends because you'd train all week, and then every weekend we'd go to tournaments, and you'd road trip together. As a kid, you'd be in your friend's parents' car with your friends, or they'd be in your car, and you'd go all around, and then you'd go out to eat afterwards. Or when you went to far away tournaments, you might go to – Disney World or all these fun cities and you do the sightseeing and that's like when you form the relationships and bonds with the people that you shared your martial arts with. And and I think that's why at an early age competition was instilled at me as being so special, not even for the competition, but more for the bonding and camaraderie that happens among students and that's what helps keep your school strong is that family and bonding. So that's why it was always instilled in me at a young age that, that competitions are so important. So yes, when my school started growing a little bit, I started obviously getting right into competition. And there's a couple of things I'd have to say about competition that I think are, are good. And one thing, I don't remember who I heard this from. A master said this to me once. And I feel that this is so valuable. I repeat it to my students all the time, and I look for opportunities to repeat it myself, but I can't take credit for it. And, and this master said to me once that one competition, if a student goes to one competition, whether they do good or bad, it's equivalent to like six months of classes, they said. Now, maybe that number is a little irrelevant or a little exaggerative, but the point they made I feel is true that there's so much value that can be taken away from a tournament, more value than you can ever get in the classroom or at months and years of training just by being exposed, seeing other things, seeing what other people are doing. To put yourself on the spot and get out there in the ring by yourself, not to mention the amount of training you put in ahead of time to prepare for the tournament. So. Yes, I think there's a lot of value in tournaments. My school is known for doing tons of tournaments. I do more tournaments than any other school in my area. Um, my students don't have to do tournaments, but we like to do a lot of them, and I, I travel all around. And yes, my most, most the one that sticks out in my mind the most for tournaments, I would have to say, is the Arnold Martial Art Festival. And it's actually sad to say that because I actually haven't attended it in like two years, but I used to go every year to it out in Columbus, Ohio. Um, and it is definitely the most unique and amazing martial art tournament I've ever been to. What what makes it unique? So you know, for those of us that haven't right. been. So the Arnold Sports Festival is the gigantic most gigantic event I've ever been to besides the martial arts section. And I think that their advertisements boast that they have more athletes than the Olympics even. But what was awesome about the martial arts section for me when I walked in there is I – while I'm a Taekwondo guy and I've trained a lot of different things, I'm definitely an advocate for loving all styles. Maybe some styles have strengths and weaknesses that are different than the others, but I find beauty in all of them for what they bring. And when you walk into the Arnold Martial Art Festival, it's just one gigantic room. But in that gigantic room, there's like 20 rings all set up for a different style. And they're all right there next to each other. So like right over here might be mats where there's guys doing jiu-jitsu. And right next to that, there might be a boxing ring with some guys doing some Muay Thai sparring. And then right next to that might be some puzzle mats on the floor with some traditional karate guys doing some katas. And then next to that, there might have a concrete floor, and there will be some guys doing some board breaking. And then over here, there's another boxing ring, and they're doing a different type of kickboxing or Muay Thai. And then over here, there's some Taekwondo guys. And then over here, there's some Wushu guys. And it's all in the same room at the same time. And that's the only time I've ever seen it like that. And, and that's what just blows me away. It's amazing about it. That sounds like a lot of fun. So I, I'm, I would guess that you would suggest that anyone that hasn't been should try and make the opportunity to go? Absolutely. I mean – Besides the martial arts, I mean, I know you know uh, from the bodybuilding, weightlifting, powerlifting, all that side of things, it's huge. But the vendors, oh my God, hundreds of thousands of vendors there, free samples, products, just amazing fun everywhere. If you're into other sports, you can watch, obviously, the weightlifting and bodybuilding and gymnastics and cheerleading and ping pong. I can't even name them all. Amazing experience. But yet, yeah, the martial arts alone, I mean, I've been there as competitors and brought my students as competitors, but also as a spectator. And it's just so much fun to be had. 
And I mentioned, you know, I'm a, I'm a road trip guy. I love the road trip. So for us from New York, that's like a 10-hour road trip. But we used to rent like a 12-passenger van, get a whole bunch of us together, and just make it a, a fun time. So I highly recommend that one in that way. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, it's the second time you've mentioned that you like road trips, and, and you mentioned being on the road with your your friends as a, as a kid. Any good road trip stories? I, I have a couple. I um, So I run a – team of martial artists that are some of my students and some students from other schools in the area. Um, I know that's not that unusual out in the bigger competition world, but in my local area, it's kind of an unforeseen thing. Like people didn't really do that. Like students didn't go to other schools to train or be a part of teams, but I kind of worked hard at building relationships to break down walls and kind of found the one or two special individuals that were like teenage, early 20s from different schools, and they were kind of not they, – they loved their school, but they were alone there. So I kind of brought them all together to thrive together, not for the purpose of promoting my own school, but more for the purpose of growing as, as martial artists. So we had a lot of fun for a long time where we did a lot of road trips and tournaments, and it was, it was me and my team was probably, you know, at any given time, 6 to 12, maybe 17 to 24-year-old guys, you know, and we'd just go around and do tournaments and stuff. I, one funny story I guess I have is, you know, I, I took it pretty seriously, even though it was all for fun. And we used to do, like, team demo at different tournaments and things like that. And one time we were headed to Maine for a tournament, and one of my guys got booked for work. He had a – I believe it was a waitress job wait, – waiter job, excuse me, waiter job somewhere. And uh, they booked him, and I was pretty mad at him because I told him that, you know, he was supposed to put in for that time off. And we couldn't really do the demo for the competition without him because – Everybody had a specific role, and not to mention, you take out that role, all of our people kind of had a, a unique flavor to them. They brought something special that was a catalyst for everybody else. So we all decided that we weren't going to let him skip out, and we got in our van on the way to the tournament. We went to his house, and we actually kidnapped him. We, we like to joke and say we kidnapped him as ninjas, but we didn't really get in the ninja costumes. We, we had the ninja <laughs> uniforms, but when he tells the story, he always says that he was uh, kidnapped by ninjas. But we showed up at his house, knocked on his door, and told him to get in the van. And he did it because he knew he had to. He knew we weren't going behind. And he lost his job because of that. But we went. Oh my. We did an awesome job at the demo. And when we got home, I made a few phone calls, and I got him a new job within a week. So I didn't feel that bad about it. And to this day, we all have a pretty good story to tell. The fact that you know nobody gets to cop out. Everybody has to be dedicated to our team. And you, you don't get to call in. You, you're going to be there, or else we're going to show up and take you. That's that is dedication, and that's certainly a great story. Glad to hear that you were able to get him another job. Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> so, how about your experience with competition? I mean, you, you, we talked about about why competition is good and the benefits, and and some of your your history. But how about now? Do you still compete? Yeah, um, I actually would say that I am more proud of my recent competition than that of when I was younger. Um, I was mildly successful in my, my younger days competing. I, I had some good wins and stuff, and I was a good competitor. But I think that um, more recently, I mean, I got out of competition in my mid-20s when I opened my school, and I focused a lot on my students. And then breaking kind of reintroduced me to competition and reforced me to start training harder again and bring myself to a new level. And to this day now, I, I, I mainly compete in breaking. Um, I do dabble a little bit in, in some forms and fighting and weapons in uh, smaller competitions, but I, unfortunately, I don't feel I have the time to commit to training to bring that to another level right now to focus on myself. But w with breaking, I definitely do um, compete a lot with that. I, I enjoy it, and I'm pretty proud of it. I do a lot of the competitions for the organization I'm a part of, the USBA, WBA, and now I've been lucky enough last year to compete at the US Open for the ISKA, which is something I'm very proud of. Great. That's awesome. So let's switch gears a little bit into some martial arts culture. Okay. If you could train with any martial artist, living or dead, who might it be and why? Ooh, that's tough. I remember I was thinking about this one. Okay. I'm actually going to take you in a slightly different direction, if you don't mind, as the answer to this question. No, that's fine. There's a lot of amazing, real martial artists out there that I have the utmost respect for. But what really has driven me most of my martial art career, is actually the fictional characters. I am definitely a product and child of all of the martial art pop culture and characters, fictional characters, 
from the 80s and 90s. Like that is really where my passion just kept growing from is all of those individuals that made martial arts what it was perceived as in the 80s and 90s, which I realize is not as real or as down-to-earth and serious as the real martial artists were in the 70s and 80s, but whatever it was that they were doing in those, those 80s and 90s movies that was a little bit out there, a little bit fictional, that's really what struck a nerve with me at an early age and, and formed my passion. As a matter of fact, in my school, I have a TV, and I, I made a thing of clips from all the 80s and 90s movies, and they're playing all the time because they're what make me happy and reminding me and motivating me as to why I am here and what I'm doing. So I don't know if I would pick a real martial artist or perhaps a fictional one, if that makes any sense. It does. Well, that, that's entirely up to you. This is your question to answer. So I still got to pick one. Damn, what am I going to pick? You do have to pick I one. To, I'll hold you to that. I have to pick one. Um, you know what I'll say? I'll say the, the first one – there has to be a value, I guess, in the first thing that pops in your head. Whether, whether you're certain or uncertain, the fact that it's the first one that pops in your head says something. And uh, I'm going to say uh, Ernie Reyes, uh, junior mm. or senior or both. Um, they kind of fit both of the two things I just said to you, both real life amazing martial artists, but also a big part of the fictional character martial artists that I grew up with that I, that I had a lot of respect for. So I would guess I would pick them, and I don't even didn't realize myself I would pick them, but now that I think about it, I would pick them. Yeah, they're, they're both fantastic, and, and I, I think my earliest – Memories of martial arts on TV were with Ernie Jr. Yep, that's, I mean... What was the name of that show? Do you remember that show? The show? Yeah, there was, there was I want to say there was a TV show he was on. I'll have to look that he up. He was on an MTV it, show in the early 2000s called The Final Foo. That was like a game show martial art thing on MTV. Um, no, this, this was back in the, the mid-80s. Yeah, he was in the movie The Last Dragon as a little kid, which is an amazing piece of that. martial art pop culture that I love. I'll, I'll I'll look it up after, yeah, after our interview know. and I'll put it up. Um, great great choice. Thanks. Do you have do you have a favorite martial arts movie? I couldn't pick one. I could ring off a couple to you real fast, such as like I said, that's fine. Last Dragon is one of my all time favorites. It's super cheesy, super silly, but it just it strikes a nerve and it gets you motivated. Um, matter of fact, last August this past year, I went to a tournament in Maryland. And I walked in the lobby, and uh, Ty Mock, I believe is how you pronounce his name, the actor from there, was standing there. And that was the first time in my life I was ever starstruck. Never been oh, starstruck cool. by anybody. He was there. I ran up to him at 34 years old. I'm like – I was just like a little kid. I was like, oh, my God, are you who I think you are? And I got my picture with him. It was amazing. Nice. Um, what was it called? Um, best of the Best, great one. I actually met when I was younger. Um, darn it. What, my mind's going blank right now. Um the lead character, um, Philip Ree. Philip Ree I met when I was younger from Best of the Best, who I like a lot because he's a real-life Taekwondo guy. And, and even though in Best of the Best it was – they were a karate team from the U.S. It, they One guy was a Taekwondo guy. The Korean team was there. It's very close to home for me. I love that movie. I also love uh, another cheesy, cheesy one was uh, No Retreat, No Surrender from the 80s. Love that one. Um the Mortal Kombat, you know, were great when you're kids. Surf Ninjas with Ernie Reyes, to name a few. Um, while I know it's not really Bruce Lee, the, the movie Dragon, the Bruce Lee story about Bruce Lee is an all-time yep. favorite of mine. I think that – I don't know because, I mean, I know there's guys out there, martial artists, that knew him, and I don't know how they feel that movie depicted him. But as a kid growing up, I feel that movie depicted him amazingly, and I feel like uh, Jason Scott Lee, the actor in that, did an amazing yeah. job. I mean I don't know to compare compared to some of these guys out there that would know, but as a kid growing up, that struck me amazing and, and made me have a love for Bruce Lee was that movie. Well, that was that was a good movie. I remember that yeah. one. Do you have a favorite actor, favorite martial arts actor? We've talked about a bunch of them. Yeah, I, I... I guess I'm a big fan of, of in more recent times during back Jet Li more than anybody. Um, I just like – not even his martial arts. I guess I like his, his acting. I like the way he acts with his martial arts and has like this just badassness about him on screen. Um, there's a lot of other guys that are more talented, and I think, with what they're showing on screen martial art-wise and things like that. But I feel like – and, and and while I have the utmost respect for Wushu, I love Wushu. I actually did Wushu like Jet Li does. But I just feel like 
what he does on screen is not necessarily what he is as a martial artist, but I just love the way it comes yeah. across on film. Yeah, he's he's a fantastic martial artist yeah. and a great actor. He'd sure. definitely be one of my faves. Okay. How about books? Are you a, are you a reader? Any martial arts books to recommend? I am embarrassed to say I'm not as big of a reader as I'd like to be, but if we talk about books, I have one book that sticks out in my mind that changed me forever. It is a book called A Killing Art. And I apologize, I don't remember the author, and I don't even remember how right. I stumbled upon it. This book is a book about, unfortunately, all the underhanded, horrible political things that take place or took place behind the scenes of the Taekwondo world in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, all the way up to 90s. And uh, growing up a Taekwondo guy, all the things that you think you know or don't know or do know, this book sheds light on so much and it just when I read it blew my mind as the research that this guy did and pointed out all these crazy political things that took place and 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 it, it just was amazing and in a good way and a bad way I mean it's good to know what somebody perceives as the truth or I mean what he has probably good evidence of and things but it didn't make me negative in any way about anything but it was definitely very enlightening to say the least I've I've read that um, the synopsis of that book, and I actually gave it as a gift at Christmas time. Um, I don't know if the person's read it yet, but now that you're saying it again, it's it's exciting me, and I need to get my own copy and read it because it it does sound fascinating. It, yeah, when that I kind of backroom intrigue. It was amazing like, when I got this book and I read it. I, I couldn't put it down, which is not like me. I'm I love reading, but I'm not a, a big reader. So for me to have not put this down was it, it was amazing. And the names, there's a lot of names in it that were very familiar to me in my world. And then I went and I was so blown away by the book, I went and bought it for like five uh, masters or grandmasters that I associate with from my Taekwondo world. And I gave it all to them, like you said, as a gift. I'm like, you guys have to read this. And then Mm. it blew their mind and we had conversations about it. And now um, my high-ranking black belts, I actually require all of them to read it so we can have discussions about it just so they can understand our history, so to say. Oh, cool. Yep. That's, That's I think that's great. Thank you. So, last question. Okay. Any martial arts themed goals that you might have that you want to share? Something you're reaching for? Yeah, I, I um, when I talked about my uh, ISKA competition last year that I competed in and and I did pretty well in, I guess that um, while I, I had the best ambition for myself and goals and worked hard, I, I didn't know how I'd fare and and I did pretty well last year and that actually opened up my eyes to the fact that I would like to go after a ISK world title which is actually my goal this year, is to, to train harder. I, I came in fourth, like I said, last year um, in the lightweight division, and my goal this year is to try to come in that first place and win an ISK world title. Well, that's fantastic. Thank good, you. good luck with that. Thank you. Uh, maybe we can have you on again Yeah. once you knock that one out and you can tell us all about it. I hope so. I'm working very hard at it, and uh, hopefully, hopefully it will be a good year. And you know what? If it's not, then next year I'll do it for it, so it's okay. That's right. I have no doubt that you'll get there. Thank you. So that kind of brings us to to your opportunity to tell us what you've got going on. I know you've got some tournaments coming up that you're promoting, and just give us a skinny on what's going on in your world. So, like I said before, my area in the capital region of New York is uh, very rich in martial arts. We have lots of martial arts schools, um, and for many years, most of them didn't mingle with each other. And one of the biggest things I take pride in is that I kind of brought competitions and community to our area by starting small and just building relationships. And now I run lots of tournaments in this area, competitions, as well as seminars and clubs where schools are mingling with each other. It's something that uh, has been very positive. The biggest event that I run every year is now in its ninth year. It's called the Northeast Open. That's uh, Saturday, August 15th in Albany. It is a – I like to say it's a mom-and-pop hometown tournament with a national feel. I do it in a nice hotel. It has a big feel to it. But the people there are just the average Joes that, you know, are local people that don't do a lot of big competitions. So it's great for a beginner. But in the black belt division, there is some really good high-ranking competitors that can give other high-ranking competitors, you know, still good competition. So it's kind of a good mix. And the event is definitely more about camaraderie than competition, we like to say, which is kind of the goal for all of our events. Everything we do we're always – we're go by the rules. We have nice rules that make everything fair, but we're not, we're not all about rules and, 
and Article 32 on page 73 of the rules states you have to do this. We're all about a good experience and, and friendliness and camaraderie um, with our events. So we have that one in August, which is, is definitely a uh, favorite in the area. But also I've given a name to all of the circuit that I'm running in this area. It's called 518 Martial Arts. Uh, 518 is our area code here, and it kind of spreads everything out, and everybody kind of uses the 518 area code as kind of a name for things in this area. So in 518 Martial Arts, we have a lot of small events. One of them is coming up at the end of April. It's called the Capital District Open. We actually call that like the little sister of the Northeast Open, just kind of a, a little hometown event to help people prepare for the Northeast Open. So we have that going on too, and those are two of the uh, main ones that we have going on right now. Great, and we'll make sure we have all those linked in the show notes. Thank you. Thank you very much. So so people can, can come, but if people were going to come in to attend one of them, the Northeast Open in August would be the one. Yeah, it's definitely a, a favorite. Um, I mean, I will say that we get 80% locals from our area, 20% coming from out, out of town. It's great. We've gotten people from Canada before, international, um, as far away as Virginia, Texas, Florida, Indiana. we got a lot of people, but it's mainly our locals. But those locals do need outside people to keep mixing it in so we get new blood, new friends, new, new people to compete against so it doesn't get boring. So we always look forward to, to new friends to come. Um, and, and we do things a little differently, but most people tend to enjoy – the, the friendly spin and camaraderie that we do at this event compared to different tournaments. And, of course, it's a beautiful time of year in upstate New York, so if someone wanted to wrap your event into a vacation... Oh, yeah, there's so many places to place go to around go. here. Our um, visitors bureau actually sets up a table, and you have uh, the beautiful Lake George is an hour away with tons of summer stuff, Saratoga Springs. There's, there's so much to do in summertime within an hour distance from Albany that if people wanted to wrap it in for a summer vacation, they have so many possibilities. Great, cool. That just about does it. Excellent. I want to... Thank you for being on. Really appreciate your time here on Whistle Kick Martial Arts Radio. I really appreciate you having me. Thank you, and I wish you the best of luck with this. I, I know that I think it's a great thing, and I hope it takes off, and I'm going to tell everybody about it, so thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Whistle Kick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you to Master Grogan for coming on and talking to me. Please be sure to subscribe to the show so you never miss one of our weekly episodes. If you like the show, we'd appreciate a five-star review on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can check out the show notes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And if you'd like to learn more about what we offer at Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel, check us out at whistlekick.com. If you want to be a guest on the show or know someone that would be a great addition, please fill out the guest form, again, at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Train hard and have a great day.